together to worship today, and uh, I'm just glad we can come in and have a good time and worship the Lord in church, and also uh, we know God's in control of everything. He's looking after his children. Amen? Glad you're in church. Give him a big amen. Ready? Amen. amen. All right. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and start with some prayer requests today. We've got a few here we want to mention. Jerry Gaines is going to have some eye surgery here in the next day or two, and he is quarantining right now before he goes. Pray for Jerry Gaines. He's still recovering from knee surgery. Also, uh, my uncle, Ransom Hendricks, up in North Wilkesboro there, Trap Hill area, uh, he passed away this week, and he was just a fine man, one of my favorites of all. And, uh, he is service today at 2 o'clock up there in the Wilkesboro. So pray for their family. I love staying with them through the summers for a week at a time when I was a little boy. Ransom and Jolene and uh, Danny, David, Patty and Pam. All the children. We had such a good time. You know, you have those favorite uncles and those favorite cousins that just kind of stand out. But I got a whole bunch of them, I tell you. A lot of good family. I thank God for the godly heritage that he has allowed me to grow up in. And I know you are as well. And if you didn't grow up in a godly heritage, you can be the starter of one. Amen. You can carry that on to your children and your grandchildren. And so God uses people to spread the gospel. So pray for Ransom Hendricks' family. His wife's name is Jolene. Also, uh, David Parrish is doing real well. I talked to him this week. David is uh, recuperating, but he's doing much better. The virus or the... Uh, Actually, it was a rash he had. It's a whole lot better now, so uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, the surgery went real well. He had a hernia removal and I think it's four bypasses, and so he really had a major heart surgery there. So pray for David and Irene. Lewis and Pauline Taylor, let's please keep them in prayers. Lewis still pretty weak, not able to eat a whole lot, and Pauline's always right by his side, so we just pray for them. God will touch and heal. Strengthen Lewis, he's a fine man. Uh, Captain and Judy, we don't want to forget them. Uh, they are such precious people. Every one of these are. But I know they've been battling for a long time, and I know we uh, have been praying for them for a long time, but we're not going to give up. Amen? We're going to keep praying for our people and God bring them through. Uh, pray for Betty Rogers. She's always tuning in. She's such a sweet prayer warrior. She's having some tests to run. Uh, then Vita Helms, let's pray for Miss Vita. Uh, she's been sick lately and not able to get out and get around like she'd like to. And so pray for Vita, such another sweet lady. And then Keith Cottle's going to be having surgery again. Uh, removal of a hernia, hernia repair. So pray for Keith. Then my sister Teresa Mitchell, she had surgery Friday. Uh, did real well, but she was in a lot of pain. She cracked her tibia, the same bone I broke. Uh, she cracked it all the way down the leg there, had an accident. So uh, she had everything repaired, and so hopefully she'll have a good rehabilitation. <coughs> Pray for Teresa, okay? Now, how are you feeling this week? Well, let's keep you in our prayers. Sure will. And go to the doctor this Thursday, okay? Well, we're going to keep you in prayers. All right. How about you, Jackie and Bobby? How y'all feeling today? Uh, we're doing pretty good. Well, yeah. we're doing pretty good. Well, praise the Lord for that. Well, we've been praying for all of you, every one of you. I've been thinking about you. you know, there's a lot of sickness going on. How about Terry? How's he doing, Carol? Well, hanging in there? Yeah. You know, we all have, uh, last night we had our. Oh, that's one. Get them all in our prayer. Charlotte, are you feeling better this week? I'm feeling a lot better. I feel better too. Thank the Lord. Thank you. Well, we're glad you're back. Okay. Charles, how's your family doing now? Doing good. Uh, brother in law got to come home. He's continuing treatment at home, and I appreciate everybody's prayers, and he does as well. Oh, praise the Lord. He's back home now. Yeah, he's got a long way to go, but he's not in the hospital. That's right. That's right. Up Kentucky. Yes, sir. We have uh, Miss Sheila Inman's going to be moving down to Florida. Pray for Sheila. Uh, we have, uh, of course, Linda and Helen have really been going and keeping in touch with Sheila since she's been over in the rest home here in High Point or Archdale. 
but she's uh, going down to Florida. She'll be right, I think, within just a few miles of her daughter and uh, her grandson and uh, their family, son-in-law there, and she's really excited. And I'm thankful that she's got some family there that can uh, kind of give her some encouragement because she's all by herself for a long time. So Sheila and we pray for her. Uh, and she moves. I hate to see her go, but I love to see her with her family. I know that gives her strength. Who else has one today you want to mention, Joe? Pray for Marie. She's having a procedure Wednesday. Okay, she's going to have a procedure this Wednesday. All right, Marie Cox. Let's keep her in our prayers. Who else has one? Yes, Chrissy. Uh, an update on Mike Bennett. Um, he went and spoke to the oncologist on Thursday. Uh -huh. They're saying right now that the cancer is stage two, and um, they're going to start chemo this Thursday, he'll have chemo um, twice a week um, every month, or yeah, two days a week for every month for the next six months. Okay. And they're then going to look and see how it's reacting and everything. So they've not done a PET scan yet, but that's his results for now. So let's just sure we keep Mike Bennett in prayer. Mike Bennett. Okay. We sure will, Christy. Who else has one? Oh, yes, we do need to pray for our God. For those that can't make it to church or even out of church today, I tell you, all across the board, people out in California. They are really suffering in California. Really? They cracked down so hard. Yeah. Dr. John MacArthur's church has stayed open. Uh, they closed for a while. The Grace Community there comes on the radio. Many of you probably heard him. Great preacher of the word. Uh, great teacher of the word, too. I love to read after and listen to him. But, uh, he has kept his church open through most of it, but they find him every week just for having church. And so they are in the process of going through trials and court and everything else. And it's really, like Billy said, we're, we're in a rough day right now. So let's just pray that God open up the doors and get this virus out of here. Help our government to seek God. And when we all seek God together, I'm telling you, great things can happen. Right. That's for sure. All right. Tom? down from jail there in uh, Asheboro, Randolph County, and uh, she has a tough job, but let's pray God's protection all around her. He puts angels around us. I really believe that. I do too. Everybody has angels around them. If you know the Lord, you have protection, and God's going to look after you. Uh, all of me, y'all feeling better today? I'm feeling better today. Oh, thank the Lord. <laughs> glad to see all of you back to church. A lot of people out sick and back today. We're glad to see all of everybody here. Who else has one? I don't want to mess anybody. Linda?
didn't mention that. Jerry's also got a daughter with cancer. Yeah, Fred.
me say that. Oh, right. Randy and Shirley. How many years, Randy? 46. 46. Give them a hand.
Last night I run down in the basement and put a little bit of music together. And we're going to try to sing it, but uh, Amen. we got to just remember what he's done for us. That's right. Not only on Calvary, not only with salvation, but I mean every single day. Amen. Amen. Always with us. Amen. And so uh, we're going to try to sing this. Uh, Joe is going to come through the piano there. If it's too loud, you just cut it off. But we're going to try to sing pray for us, but uh, simply say it's just so you will know. Amen.
today with me at Matthew chapter 22. While you're turning there, Chrissy brought in a bunch of eggs back there in cartons. And if you would like to get some of those eggs, they're free of charge. You don't find many things free anymore. And so if you want some good fresh eggs, Chrissy, we thank you for doing that. Just go by and pick some up as you leave in the uh, kitchen area there. And uh, then their contribution statements are ready for you. Uh, they're on the table as you leave here. And we appreciate everybody that has given so gracefully to the church to keep the ministry going here at Grace Baptist. Then we have uh, still a lot of Christmas cards there. If you know somebody, you could take some to, pick them up and bring them out. I know it to make their day. Cheer them up a little bit, knowing that, uh, hey, we're thinking about you. We had not forgot you. God's still on the throne. Okay, we're going to bring a message today on will the dead live again? Will the dead live again? That's probably the question of the ages. Everybody's always been concerned with it, as we're going to get to in a few moments. Is there really life after death? Well, we're going to see what Jesus has to say about this. And he's asked, and notice with me, if you will, Matthew chapter number 22, starting at verse number 23. It says here, the same day came to him, that would be Jesus, the Sadducees. They're a religious movement. I always call them the Sadducees because they were sad all the time. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. But anybody that doesn't know the Lord is sad. I feel like they don't have that joy. And they were enemies of the Lord. The Pharisees and Sadducees gave him a hard time. That's what they're trying to do now. Trick him. But he knows what they're doing. He's got in the flesh. And so they're trying to give him a trick question. So they came to him. And it says here, these Sadducees say that there is no resurrection. They didn't believe in the miracles. And they asked Jesus in verse 24, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, passed away, and having no issue or children, left his wife unto his brother. Verse 26, likewise the second also, and the third, and the seventh. And then it says in verse 27, and last of all the woman, she died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. Hey, they're supposed to be the religious authorities. And he says, you don't really know the scripture, knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Verse 30, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they're like the angels of God in heaven. But as touching and the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I'm glad of that, aren't you? Then in verse number 33, when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Right before our message today, will the dead live again? I just want to give you a, a quick backdrop here. Yes. <laughs> yes, they will live again. Father, thank you again for allowing us the privilege to be back in church today. I thank you for each one that were able to come to be with us here in I pray a special blessing upon them as we study the word and those who are looking on by the means of internet and Lord, those who listen by the radio ministry so many ways to try to get the word out. And I pray for those on the prayer list, those who are having surgery, those who have been through surgeries, those who have lost loved ones with a bereaved heart today. Bring them comfort. Bring them strength. This world is not all there is to it. It's only a preparation for the everlasting life that's laid up for the child of God. Fill us all with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. I always like to try to tell something a little funny to get started. I heard about Grandpa Jones celebrating his 100th birthday. And everybody complimented him on how athletic and well-preserved he appeared, even at 100 years old. And they were asking him what his secret was. He said, gentlemen, I'll tell you the secret of my success he said, I have been out in the open air every day, day after day now for 75 years. And everybody was so impressed with that. 
And they ask him, well, how did you manage to keep up such a rigorous fitness routine like that? Going out every day for 75 years. And so he said, well, it's like this. My wife and I, we have been married for 75 years. On our wedding night, we made a solemn pledge. Whenever we had a fight, the one who was proved wrong would go outside and take a walk. <laughs> so I've been walking about 75 years now. Anyway, throughout history, mankind has always had a fascination with the fact of whether there is really life after death. We know the Bible teaches, hey, to be absent from that body is to be present with the Lord for the child of God. This is only the tabernacle the Bible teaches, like a little tent we, we go around in for a few years on this earth, but the real person is either going to go to heaven or hell. And if you come to Christ, you're as sure of heaven as if you were already there. You have present tense, everlasting life. But even the people of antiquity, they had a belief that there was life that continued after you completed your life on earth. The Egyptians, they believed in life after death to the point that even the pharaohs, they would build these pyramids and they would put boats and supplies in there so they could sail through the heavens after their death on this earth. The American Indians sometimes were buried with their bow and arrows and their horses so they could enjoy hunting in the next life on the happy hunting ground. Then the ancient Greeks, they would actually be buried with a coin so they could pay the fare over the ma uh, magic river of death and enter into the next life. Eskimos, even up in Alaska, they were buried with a sled dog so that they could help them cross over into the afterlife. So we see there's ingrained in every person a desire to live forever. And so as we're looking at this passage, that is the background. Now notice the question of the Sadducees. Verse 23 again. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. They ask him. Now the Sadducees, as I said, they are a religious group, but they're the liberal group of the day. They're very wealthy men because they got big profits from the sacrifices that were sold in the temple. And they're also backed by the Roman government. And so the Roman leaders allowed these Sadducees to make big profits off of the Jewish people in the name of organized religion. And if somebody came and they wanted to offer a sacrifice, the Sadducees were in charge of that, and they may charge them double or triple of what it was really worth. And they would pocket that money. That's how they became very rich and wealthy. And these Sadducees, they did not believe in miracles. They did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. And they only really believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. Of course, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they felt like nowhere in those first five books does it ever teach a resurrection from the dead. So they didn't believe in it. And they believed that death just ended man's existence, and they were on the opposite side of what the Pharisees <laughs> believed theologically, politically, and even socially. And they were very powerful men. Now the Pharisees, they were very strict. They did believe in a resurrection. They did believe in the miracles, but not these Sadducees. They're the liberals of the day. And so they do have one common ground together. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they both joined together to try to get rid of Jesus. Because everyone was following him instead of them. And it was also hurting their pocketbook. And so they said, hey, we've got to do something. We've got to get rid of this man. Everybody's turning to him. We've got to silence him. They were so jealous of Jesus and his great following. So they put their differences aside theologically. Well, we don't believe in miracles. You do believe in miracles. That's fine. We'll just let them go to the side and we'll join together and see if we can't get rid of Jesus. Now, notice the question that's framed here. They're trying to incriminate the Lord. This is the very last week, by the way, of his earthly life before he goes to the cross. And so they're trying their best to catch him in a lie or catch him in something they use against him. And the situation may have been a real life case, but it's probably made up when you read about it. They're trying to construct a trick so that they can get Jesus to say something they can incriminate him on. So we see it in verse number 24. Master, 
Moses said, If a man die and have no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now this refers to the law of the Leverite marriage. It's found over in Deuteronomy chapter number 25. It was a provision given by Moses, or God really, in the Old Testament, to ensure that the family lines of the Jewish people were kept intact, also that the widows would be cared for. So the law protected women who were left alone. If their husband died, and there was a brother there, he had to take her as his wife. And they had no means of support other than that. So they call him master. But to them, he is anything but their master. They use that just to try to get his attention. It's sarcasm at its worst. They're only interested in bringing Jesus to his death. That's all they want to do is kill him. So they come up with a story here that supposedly is true. And they point out this passage in Deuteronomy 25 and verse 5 and 6. You may want to write it down there in your passage. I'll read it to you. Here's what they were using. Way back in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 25, verse 5 and 6. Moses said, And brethren dwell together, and one of them die and have no child. The wife of the dead shall not marry a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and shall take to him to wife, and perform the duty of the husband's brother and daughter. And it shall be the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of the brother that is dead, that his name is not put out in Israel. So that was a law that was given back in Moses' day to preserve the family line and also to care for the widows. Now, if a brother refused to perform that duty, and sometimes that happened, then the widow would go to the elders of the city and tell them her predicament. And she'd say, well, he won't marry me. And I don't have another husband to raise up children unto my husband's name. And so what they would do, they would bring him in and she would take off the shoe of the unwilling brother and spit in his face as an act of shame and dishonor for refusing to marry her and to raise up a child in the memory of her first husband. And it happened from time to time. And so with that in mind, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 25. I want you to see this story that's based on that teaching. Now back in Matthew 22, verse 25, here is the story. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased. He died, having no issue or no children, he left his wife unto his brother. Now the first brother here, he marries a wife, dies prematurely, no doubt, in his young age. He didn't have any children that could carry on the family name. And so the wife is supposed to marry the next brother in line. Well, look at verse 26, likewise, the second also, and the third, and even up to the seventh. <laughs> That's a lot of brothers dying real quickly here. I'm going to tell you, if I were that seventh brother, I believe I'd have got out of town. <laughs> Something's going on here. <laughs> These brothers are dropping like flies. <laughs> you remember Blanche Taylor Moore, the so-called Black Widow of North Carolina? put on death row for killing at least three victims, possibly four, poisoning the fifth victim with arsenic. I think there's something wrong here. It kind of sounds like her. And this lady in this story is getting rid of these husbands so fast and then runs out of husbands. So they tell Jesus the lady's been married to seven husbands. Nobody's next in line. And notice verse number 27. And last of all, the woman died. Now the woman who had been completely exhausted, I'm sure, after seven husbands, she dies as well. Now comes the trick question. Verse 28. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? They all had her. <laughs> whose wife is she going to be? Hey, she's got seven husbands. Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And they know that Jesus did teach the resurrection in his ministry. And among the Jews, there were those who did believe in the resurrection. They believed that she came back just like he left, both in appearance and in relationship. So if this be the case, then what relationship would this woman have with all seven husbands? Since God never condones polygamy, the thinking was, which one of these husbands is the real husband? And 
which one would be the one the wife would live with throughout all eternity if indeed there is a resurrection? So that's the question. Now look at number two, the response of Jesus. I love how he handles this. Notice verse number 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. He says, you really don't know what you're talking about. You're supposed to be the religious leaders and you don't even know the word of God. And friends, the Old Testament teaches the resurrection just like the New Testament teaches the resurrection. He's saying, you don't really know what the Old Testament scriptures teach, nor do you understand the mighty power of God. It's strong enough to do whatever God intends for it to do. The word for air in verse number 29, you do air. That word means to go astray, means to deceive. It means to seduce or be out of the way in the Greek language. So Jesus recognized these religious leaders had strayed away from the truth of the word of God. They're setting up their own man-made doctrines to make it fit their way of thinking. And friends, that is always dangerous. It is not what you think. It is not what I think that really matters. What really matters is what God thinks. And what God says in the word of God, that's our authority. So verse number 30, here's his answer. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. The Sadducees, they didn't even believe in angels. So here Jesus is exposing another one of their false beliefs. Angels are deathless creatures. They do not propagate or have children. Therefore, there's no need of marriage with angels. They're in a fixed state. And then it says in the resurrection. I mean, the saints will have those same characteristics. So Jesus is saying that we're going to be like the angels. But we're not going to be angels, by the way. There are There is a teaching going around, you know, so-and-so got his wings and they got the wings. But actually, if the truth be known, angels are a separate breed of the creation of God. We will have glorified by like Jesus. We will travel at speed of thought. We will go right through walls. There's no need for us to have wings. We can move just like Jesus did. But angels do not reproduce themselves. Therefore, in heaven, there is no death. There is no marriage. There is no need to reproduce ourselves in the city of God. And so Jesus here is not saying that a husband and wife who are very close to each other, that they won't know each other in heaven. Surely they'll know each other in heaven. If they want to be together, surely they're going to be together in heaven. The Bible said you'll know them in heaven just like you knew them on this earth. But there's no need to have children. I believe you'll be able to live with your family. I believe you'll be able to live with your neighbors. I believe you'll know, hey, there's my wife. He's my husband. But there's no need for marriage or even having other children in heaven. It is a fixed state there. Now, Jesus is saying there's no need of marriage between a man and a wife, no need to continue the race by birth because we're all going to be married to Jesus. And he is the bridegroom and we are the bride. But yet, I believe you'll know your wife and your husband just like they are, and I believe you'll help them just, hey, if you know them down here, surely you'll know more up there than you know down. Listen to what the Bible said. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. The marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. This is describing the marriage of the church to Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But it doesn't say we won't know each other. Surely we'll know each other. If we knew each other on earth, we'll know each other in heaven just like we knew each other on earth. And I believe we'll be with each other throughout all eternity. God established marriage in the Garden of Eden. God commanded Adam and Eve to reproduce, to populate the world. Genesis 2.18 says, It is not good, the Lord says to Adam, that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. So in heaven, there's a fixed state. The angels are created by God even before the world was created. The Bible said in the book of Job, when God created the world, the angels rejoiced. They were already created. Job 38, verse 6, 7, and 8. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars, there's the angels, they sang together, the sons of God shouted for joy. That's the angels. Who shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? 
Job was in a terrible ordeal. He lost his children. He lost his wealth, his health. And now his wife tells him, curse God and die. Boy, God got her back in him because she had 10 more children. <laughs> That's 90 months of pregnancy. That's a whole lot more than sickness and regurgitation, amen. But I don't teach her to talk about God. <laughs> Moving on very quickly. <laughs> Job, <laughs> Job thinks because of all of his problems that he's been through, God's losing control of the whole universe. Have you ever thought that, friend? I think that's a natural tendency when everything goes wrong. Lord, are you seeing what's happening? <laughs> Lord, have you forgot about me? He ain't forgot you. He loves you. He loves you and he loves your family and he's going to make sure your family, you and your family are together throughout all eternity. I believe that. And maybe things didn't work out the way you planned them to work out and we're tempted to say, well, God must have forgot about me. He must be losing control. But friends, let me assure you this morning, God knows everything that happens and he loves you very much and he still has a plan and he's still working in your behalf. He's going to take care of you, your husband, your wife, your children, just like he has in the past. He'll do it today and he'll do it tomorrow. Jesus Christ, the same forever. So God asked Job, Job, where were you when I created the earth? And all the angels of God shouted for joy. So the angels of God were created before the earth in a big state. Sadly, the Bible teaches one-third of the angels fell with Lucifer. They rebelled against God. They became demons. But there's two-thirds that remain faithful to God. They are the good angels. So the question comes to mind. Well, if there's no marriage, then well, do we really know each other? Sure we do. We'll know each other in heaven. We'll have a heavenly body. It'll be recognizable. You'll know your husband. You'll know your wife in heaven just like as if you were married to them on earth. And I think you'll live right there with them just like you did here. But there's no need to have children because there's no reproduction in heaven. The point of the passage here is this. We're going to all be together in heaven loving each other perfectly. Boy, that's hard to do on earth, but in heaven we're going to finally be able to do that. Is it hard to live together perfectly on this earth? Do you ever get in a fuss with your husband or wife? Don't, don't raise your hand. I don't get anybody in trouble. We made a deal, my wife and I, kind of like the one I told you about. We'd never go to bed mad at each other when we got married. We've been married now for about 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? We have always practiced that, but there was one time we didn't sleep for three months. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But we're going to know each other. You're going to know your husband. You're going to know your wife. We'll be smarter up there in, the, in heaven than we are on this earth. We're going to know each other. We're going to have full knowledge. But we will have a resurrected body. We won't have another family because there's no need of that in heaven. Listen to this verse. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly. We don't see as good as we could, but then we're going to see each other face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I have known. He's teaching there we're going to know each other just like we knew each other on this earth. I thank God knew that you love your husband, your wife, your children. You'll be together. But there's no need to have children up there. So now we are in an imperfect body. We have sickness. We have pain. We have disease. But thank God one day we'll be in a perfect body with a perfect mind, with a perfect family, with a perfect place. And we'll have a perfect Savior to worship in a perfect eternity. And in heaven... We're never separated from them again. You'll always be with your husband. You'll always be with your you'll always be with your loved ones. After you've been in a church over 25 years, you've seen a whole lot of people come and go, and it breaks your heart because you're family with them. And I'm longing to see some of my loved ones. My mother's up there. <laughs> and my grandmothers are up there. And all of my family, a lot of them are, they're already up there. One day I'm gonna see them again. I'm going just like I do them down here. Hey, there's cousin so and so. Hey, there's uncle so and so. Hey, mom, love you. Let me hug you again. How do you know that? Well, the Bible teaches that we're going to know each other just like we knew each other down here on this earth. King David had a baby, and she was, the baby was sick unto death, and David fasted and prayed that God would spare the life of that little baby. And the baby died, and you know what David did? They thought, oh, he's, he's going to be a gone over the edge. No, he got up, he shaved, put on his clothes, went down there, he ate some food, hadn't eaten in a couple of weeks. He'd been fasting and praying and asking God to spare the baby. God didn't spare the baby. And the baby went to heaven. 
How do you know that? Well, they couldn't believe it because David got up and said, let's go to church. I'm ready now. They said, you mean you're going to get up and go and you've been sitting here all of this time fasting, not eating, you got a beard, you look terrible, and he cleaned up and he ate and he said, I'm ready to go. Why is that, David? Well, listen to what 2 Samuel 12, 23 says. David made this statement that tells me little babies are under the grace of God and they're in heaven. Look at verse 23. He is dead, wherefore shall I fast? Why am I going to fast now? The little baby's passed away. Can I bring him back again? The implication is no, I can't bring him back from the dead. Only God can do that. But he does say this, I shall go to be with him. What do you think he's talking about? I'll see him again in heaven. He's up in heaven. I'll go up there and I'll be with him again. But he's not going to come back right now. God has a plan. That indicates that we're going to know each other in heaven just like we knew each other on this earth. It teaches us little babies and children who may die prematurely or under the grace of God automatically they're in heaven. What a gracious God we serve. Think about this, friends. The great apostle Paul, he expected to see every person he won to Christ in heaven one day. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19 and 20. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. What is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? You are our glory and joy. He is saying, I'm going to see every one of you. You made that profession of faith. You got saved and glory to God. I'll see you again one day when I get to heaven. Who are you going to look for when you get to heaven? If they trusted Jesus Christ, They'll be there. You'll be there. You'll know them just like you knew them here. When Jesus took Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw two men that had been gone hundreds of years. How do you, how do you explain that? They'd never met them. Peter, James, and John had never met Moses and Elijah. And yet they knew who they were. They didn't even tell them. Moses had been dead 1,400 years, and God buried the body of Moses so they wouldn't dig it up and worship it. Elijah had been taken to heaven in a chariot of fire 700 years earlier. Peter never met him to one of them, and yet he calls them by name. Hey, there's Moses, there's Elijah. And there they are in a recognizable body, talking with Jesus, talking about his upcoming sacrifice on the cross. That leads us to believe they know each other, they love each other in heaven just like they did on this earth. I mean, when I get to heaven, I'm going to get behind one and Woo! Scare her. She's going to jump in and foot, and I'm going to be gone. And then guess what she's going to do the same to me? <laughs> I'm going to jump in and foot. Then I'm going to hug her. Matthew 17, listen to what it says here. This is what I'm talking about. Somebody said, what kind of body do you have in heaven? Well, it's a recognizable, a recognizable body. It's a body that they knew about. I mean, these men are in heaven, and somehow God lets them come back to the earth and talk to Jesus. Matthew 17, 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them up to this high mountain, and he was transfigured. His face shone as the sun. His raiment was white like lightning. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's so good if we're up here. If you will, let me build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. How did Peter know who these men were? He'd never met them. And yet, he wants to build a tent or a tabernacle for them. That indicates we're going to recognize each other in heaven, even with a glorifying body. Now, let's go back and finish it up. What Jesus is trying to get across. What is he trying to say? Look again at Matthew 22, verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Say, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. <laughs> Jesus knows the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection based on their belief because they didn't think the first five books of the Bible taught the resurrection. And yet Jesus goes right to those books and shows them it does teach the resurrection. He quotes this from the book of Exodus. That's the second book. He is explaining to them that God will be over all the living throughout all eternity. Notice what it says in Exodus 3, 6. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. 
And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look upon God. That's present tense. He is explaining to Moses, as well as to all Christians today, righteous people who are saved, that God knows where our loved ones are. They're still alive, and they're doing well up there. Woo! That makes me feel good. That makes me feel good. The point is this. If God introduced himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he said, I am, that present tense, these patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they died hundreds of years earlier, so there must have been life after death if they're still alive in Moses' day. So Jesus tells them, you don't know the scriptures. The scripture says there's a resurrection. The scripture says we will live after this world is ended. Why? Wow, we're going to heaven. We're going to be with each other. Matthew 8, 11. Matthew 8, 11. Listen to what Jesus said here. He indicates it. I say to you, many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. If Jesus says Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive in heaven, we know they're doing well after thousands of years. Physical death does not stop the believer from living forever. It only ushers him or her into the presence of God. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5 8. 2 Corinthians 5 8. We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You're going to be with him when you leave this world. He's talking to these Sadducees. God's mighty power will sustain and allow the child of God to live forever and ever with our loved ones, with our family members, with our friends, with our church up there in heaven. We will be resurrected like Jesus Christ. Woo! There is life after death. You haven't seen your loved one for the last time. I know it breaks our heart to see them lower down in that grave. It just, just tears you up. It takes you a long time. Don't think you ever get over it. But Jesus used even the authority of those books that they didn't even trust, that they said they only believed them. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Jesus took Exodus and proved to them there is life after death. Even if there was no need to have children, you're still going to love your wife. You're still going to love your children. You're still going to love your husband. You're still going to love your church family. Therefore, the faulty question... <laughs> does not hold up based on the power of God and the Word of God. You rest assured this morning, friends, God will take care of you. He will take care of your loved ones. You will see them again one day. And what was the response? Look back at Matthew 22, 33. Here it is. When the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. I mean, when they finally heard the answer Jesus gave according to the resurrection... They are amazed at his wisdom and his power. Why? Because he knows we'll see each other again. We'll live with each other again. Peter knew Elijah. Peter knew Moses. They've been gone hundreds of years. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were already up in heaven. They've been gone thousands of years. That tells me, friends, it's good to know we're saved. Now that's not for the unsaved person. The unsaved person is going to Die without Christ and be cast into a lake of fire forever and ever. They're going to be separated from their loved ones and even separated from the grace and mercy of God. I'm glad I'm saved, aren't you? I'm glad I'm going to heaven. I'm glad the Bible said that Jesus Christ rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave, carrying the keys of eternal life, saying, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He or she that believes in me, though he were dead, woo, yet shall he live. We're going to live with him. Have you come to the Lord and have you been saved? If you have, congratulations. The best decision you've ever made. But if you have never been saved, I encourage you, come to the Lord, live forever so you can be with your family, so you can be with your friend, so you can be with Jesus throughout all eternity. Just think about what a reunion that's going to be one day when we get to heaven. The Bible said there's rejoicing in heaven amongst the angels when a child of God gets saved. Who do you think's doing that? It says it's among the angels. It's not the angels that's rejoicing. It's our loved ones looking down, seeing us get saved. Woo! My son, my daughter, my granddaughter, they just got saved. They're going to be with us forever and ever. What a wonderful promise.
That ought to make enough, be enough to make a Presbyterian shout. <laughs> Woo! We're going to be saved. We are saved when we trust Christ, but we're going to be with him throughout all eternity. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads about. Eyes are closed. Is there life after death? Oh, yes. Jesus made it very clear. Will we know each other in heaven? Oh, yes. Jesus made it very clear. No need for child reproduction because we're already there. But he says you will know each other just like you know them here. We'll be smarter up there than we'll be here. So maybe you'd say, Preacher, I've never been saved, but I'd like to be. If that's the case, you can ask him into your life today. Would you pray in your heart something like this? Dear Jesus, I trust you as my Savior. Thank you for dying on that cross just for me. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Save my soul. Make me a home in heaven. In Jesus' name. Heads about and eyes are closed. If you made that decision, if you prayed that prayer, I just want to say you've made the best decision you could ever make. And if you've done that today, I just want to congratulate you. I'm not coming to you. I wouldn't embarrass anyone, but I would like to pray for you. If you ask Christ to be your Savior, would you just look up for a moment? I'll pray just for you today. Anyone, anyone? Pray to pray for me. God bless you. Thank you for that answer. Maybe today you'd say, I know the Lord. I'm so glad I'm saved. Pray for me. I've got a burden on my heart. I've, I've got some prayers that I've been praying and it seems like it's just not breaking through. And I know the Lord can hear and answer and I know we got all things are possible. Pray to be my prayer partner. Pray with me. I'll be glad. You know like that? You just lift a hand up. God knows what's heavy on your heart. Father, we come today and pray that you'll bless each one that came today. Thank you, Lord, that we have that promise that we will live eternally with you and with each other and knowing each other. Be a blessing to be with our family, our loved ones, those who have gone on before us. Be a blessing just to sit at your feet, Lord, and just worship you. And Father, bless each one that raised a hand to show today and that they had trusted Christ and that they've got it settled. Bless them, be with them in a wonderful way. Let them know they made the best decision they could ever make. And I pray for each one that has a burden on their heart. Whatever that, whatever that burden is, Lord, you know it. I know you can answer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let the devil trying to stop everything, but that's okay. God's still on the throne. Let's have a remitation. Let's all stand together. Charles will play. If you like, come around the altar. You just come down. And he'll be here to help you. He'll be here to give you strength. He'll be here to do anything you need him to do for you, friends. If you've never been saved, we'll be glad to pray with you. You come. If you want to come down here and join the church today, I'll meet you here. You just come and we'll rejoice having you as a member. Whatever the Lord leads you to do. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Christians are praying. You come if God is leading you today. Amen. you to look up and see a young man that got saved here and wants to come and unite here at this church. Keith the Clue. Keith loves the Lord and I'll tell you he's been a real blessing to us. And uh, his wife, y'all come on up here and stand with him, the whole family if you will. I know how to give him some support. <laughs> they said they didn't want to go but that's okay. Y'all can come. Alrighty. <laughs> here we go. And it's a blessing. Joanna. Joanna. Uh, told him about the Lord and actually led him to the Lord and then got him down here with us and he loves this church and he had, they have precious family together and I thank God for Keith, Joanna, how many, it's been about a month now? Y'all been married? About, about, about a month and they're starting on the right foot. Wouldn't you say that? Everybody excited for him to come and join? Give him a big amen. Ready? Amen. amen. All right. Let's give the Lord a big praise today. Thank you. You can come by and speak to him. You don't have to shake hands. No, I know we're in a different day. We will one day. But let him know you appreciate him coming and joining here at Grace Baptist Church. Keith, we love you and love Joanna. Y'all are such a blessing. And we're glad to have you as members.
All right, let's be dismissed in prayer at this time. Randy, if you would, you dismiss us. Tell somebody you love them. Have a happy week. Brother Randy. Lord God in heaven, I thank you, Father, for an opportunity, Lord, to just be in a place, Lord, that you know we are loved, we yes. know we are cared for, Lord, and we thank you so much for being the master of love, Father, for the example that we need each and every day, Lord, help us to use our lives, Lord, to encourage and strengthen, Lord, and to uh, encourage others, Lord, to help us to in a real way. And I pray, Lord God, to take us from here now, Lord, and bring us back rejoicing. Congratulations, brother. Good to see you from the Lord. You can see us. I love this church. My church is real. Real good church. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> I'm like, girl, we're not supposed to hug, but definitely happy to have y'all just having this morning. God bless the Yes, we do. Three times. Five hundred times. We're praying for him. God bless you. God bless you. She just don't know you, do you? Glad to have you with us. We'll hug you, but I guess we won't. You know, you know what, my, what my teacher's doing? Elbow uh, but, well, I'm the hugger of the church. I, I officially made myself that. But I can't do it now. Anyway, hug you. Congratulations and welcome to the Thank you.
Thank you. 